It's been a while, ladies and gentlemen, since I've done one of these videos. It's not because I haven't been working on the books. Trust me, I've been working on them. It's just that these books are taking a lot longer than I anticipated. It, <clears throat> it, it really does surprise me just how much work needs to be done in order to <laughs> make a series of books. It took me off guard, uh, but they're still being written. I'm still working on some of the third drafts on a bunch of them, proofreading them and sending them out to more beta readers, getting some pretty great, there's a hair on my microphone, getting some pretty great feedback uh, as grammatically as well as thematically. And things are still going, but today on Concerning the Godzilla Saga, we are going to be talking about what is known as, in this universe, as the Ukrainian Crisis. This event is important because it sets up Russia in a very key way within this alternate universe. Something people remotely interested in history may note that many events happened in both our universe and this universe just at a later date. This is true, but the alternate timeline it is much, much worse. So in this timeline, it is much, much worse. This was Russia's answer to the further globalization of Europe. The EU uh, being dissolved in favor of a more globalized government in the UN, this was also seen as a chance for the new Russian government, elected only recently into power, to show off their might to the rest of the world. Not really to show against the US, but the EU. This being the first nationalist movement, if you want to know more about this first national movement, listen to the previous video I did for, for concerning the Godzilla saga. The Crimea was always a part of Russia even before the Soviet Union, and only became sovereign after the fall of said Soviet Union, which is what happens in our timeline. This, this is history. Like in our timeline, the Ukraine basically falls into a mini civil war between the nationalists wanting to remain a sovereign nation and those, mainly of Russian descent, wanting to join the Russian Federation, which the Russian Federation is what, you know, Russia became after the fall of the Soviet Union in both our timeline and this timeline. This basically created a rift in the country, in the Ukraine. You have the West versus the East. Russia sees this as not only a chance to gain power in the UN, but also to show that this new government, again the first nationalist order, will, are willing to do what is necessary. At first, the Russian invasion was housed with great praise in the southeast. Many of the Russians were seen as liberators in the Ukraine. But this was a massive shock to the UN, so, so much so that for almost a full year, they did nothing but desperately try to pool their resources together. To put it politely, they were not ready for an invasion-war. What follows is Russia basically taking all of the Crimea with little opposition. The Ukrainian government basically was... Uh, they had nothing to deter the Russians and call upon the UN for aid. The UN calls upon the US for help. It, it is basically Britain, and the UN basically is like Britain in World War II before the United States entered the war. We are a massive industrial complex. We, we don't have manpower per se, but the resources and economic might to just pour resources into a conflict. This is why if America and Russia were to actually go to war, we would ultimately win because we have the economic might that the Russians do not. The US at first refuses to help the UN. This was a European problem, not the US, very I, very similar to World War II and the fallout of World War I. This is in the doctrine that has been housed in the US since the end of the second Iraq-Iran war of a, a bias towards American isolationism uh, by both the left and the moderate right but again, mainly the left. It's funny how the roles have naturally reversed in this universe compared to ours. Instead, in our universe, the right is calling for more of an isolationist stance in the global theater, and the left is calling for a more globalized theater. In this universe, it's kind of the opposite, just how things naturally progressed. As a result, the UN continues to pool their resources and just speak out against Russia. 
they issue a crap ton of tariffs and such, but it really does little to combat Russia's war effort. It was here that the Russian president said if words were water, the UN would be drowning in it. Russia's hold on Ukraine was harsh. Any sort of protest or demonstration was instantly silenced, no questions asked. This was achieved by a group known as the Little Green Men. These were the first Russian soldiers to enter the Ukraine. Just like in our timeline, they had Russian green uniforms, but no national insignias. These were led by Major Nikolai Reznov, who was an extremely important character in the Godzilla saga. Despite there being a clear line between the East and West Ukraine, things calmed down for about six months into the conflict. Russians even began moving into Russia-occupied Crimea. This quote-unquote peacetime would last a little over two years, though the UN was still preparing themselves in order to help balance the state of power in Europe, and America still remaining neutral. Soldiers stationed in the Ukraine began to look at this as their home. These are Russians that had just moved in, and they began to look at this new territory as a place to live, as a place to start a family. By the third year there in the Ukraine, many had even started families with civilians within the country. This included Major Reznov. Then came a massive demonstration in major cities across occupied territories. Partisans, as the Russians officially referred to them, launched a series of strong and decisive attacks on government buildings, Russian businesses and banks, and even some armaments. It was embarrassing to the Russians because they had let their guard down through this peacetime, and that now the Ukraine partisans had successfully stolen not only money, but a lot of arms. It was also discovered that the UN had organized the attacks by training several members of the Ukrainian military as well as giving them arms. Then the Russians sent in General Gregory Zhukov III, the grandson of the Great Marshal of the East during World War II. This man had made a name for himself in the Federation's Secret Service, smuggling G-cells from the United States into Russia, which was a big no-no, as well as him having the nickname Ursus. Ursus quickly became known for his ruthless tactics, and would often employ the same tactics here in the Ukraine. He would round up the partisans into an area where they feel safe, surround it, then push through at one point after they had exerted themselves. However, it was bloody, and made the UN's distaste for the Russians even worse. Once again, the UN called upon America to help rearm them to prepare for a full-scale war between the powers of NATO, what remained of them, and the Russian Federation. And again, the U.S. remained neutral until it was discovered that the nationalist government of Russia had been caught smuggling more G-cells out of Area G. Again, if you want more information on those, watch another video uh, in this playlist. A man was literally caught red-handed, and though this man was not directly tied with Russia, it was clear that Russia had hoarded him there. It wasn't justification for a war, however. It's common knowledge that people have been smuggling Godzilla cells out of Area G ever since 2029. But it was enough to cause the U.S. president at the time to not only lift America's isolationist stance and also begin sending supplies over to the U.N. To the Americans, this was seen as a win-win. The right had gotten their way in breaking the isolationist mantra adopted by U.S. politics. The middle class was put to work creating weapons for the U.N. And the left, who had still a majority in the legislative and executive branch, housed a victory amongst the American people. People liked jobs because jobs meant stability and money, and money meant they could spend it. The U.N. began to supply what remained of the Ukraine with arms and full-on battles began to take place along the border between East and West Ukraine. But these did not last long because the UN were still unwilling to put their ally boots on the soil, and the Russians were highly trained by now. This was the beginning of the end, though. For the first time in Russian history, they were victims of sheer numbers. 
they could not afford to keep a steady war effort at this point due to the horrible budget issues within the country, while the UN could still pump out whatever they wanted because now they had the aid from the United States. Things began to deteriorate even worse for the Russians after nearly five years of the Ukraine being split. The nationalists had been voted out of power in the latest election, and it became clear that this new government wanted the fight in the Ukraine to cease. The result was a split country between those who still wanted the Ukraine and those who didn't. Protests were often violent in the streets, and specifically Moscow, and this carries over into the Godzilla saga. By the middle of the sixth year of the Ukrainian crisis, the UN had finally had enough. They sent an ultimatum to the Russian representative in the UN that said that if they do not leave the Ukraine as a sovereign nation within three months, Allied troops will enter the war. And the current Russian government believed this. The result were many civilians being left behind at the end of those three months. And UN troops marched into the Ukraine and reunified the country. Most of the people left behind were civilians with families now in Russia or vice versa. This fact is extremely important for certain characters within the Godzilla saga. The UN ultimatum said that if a single Russian or Russian-affiliated soldier entered Ukrainian territory, it would mean automatic war, and Russia could not afford this or risk another revolution like in 1917 between the nationalists and those who wished to remain with the UN. And that brings us to the Godzilla saga. Now, a lot of you are asking, what does this really have to do with Godzilla itself, other than, you know, the G-Cell thing? Well, that's just it. These are lore videos, to be very precise. Lore videos to explain the universe that has been created. And these situations have all stemmed off from the 1954 attack. And this is basically the context setting up the story. These aren't real spoilers for the books. These are contexts to help you enjoy the books and understand the universe even more. So like the Godzilla Saga on Facebook, like A and Productions on Facebook, follow our websites. I'm actually building one currently for the Godzilla Saga. Stay tuned for that. I'm also built one for A and Productions. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of A and Productions saying, Sayonara. <laughs>